Uh, I'm Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia, and um, I'm helping do this recurring series for posterity, and hopefully it's just generally interesting about the history and evolution of the web, conversations with people who are there along the way, um, hopefully, you know, gaining some good information and stories that we'll now have forever. So last time at Blink on 13, I talked to Darren Fisher and Bet Gujar, which we reminisced about some very, very early days of the web. And this time I'm here with uh, two other friends at Google. I'm Ben. Hey, everybody. Um, I lead the product side of the web platform team. So we talked about Ben Gujar a moment ago. I work very closely with Ben. And uh, I work very closely with this other guy, Dion. In fact, uh, he'll give a little bit of our background in a minute. But we've worked together for Dion, I want to say, 15 years. Is that right? I think um, even more, maybe, yeah. Even more. That's probably true on various aspects of the web. Um, so before we started working together here at Google, we were together uh, at Walmart Labs, where we were working on uh, Walmart's digital experiences, their website, their mobile apps. And then before that, we were at Palm working on WebOS together. And before that, we were at Mozilla working on uh, developer tools together. And then uh, before that, we were doing this thing called ajaxkin.com, which was a uh, media property and conference series that uh, a blog, I guess I should say, uh, <laughs> a conference series that was covering uh, the Ajax movement. And uh, before that, we had different, different gigs, but we would travel uh, around the US and give talks together on the same conference circuit. And uh, I'll pass it over to you, Dion. Sure, thanks. Yeah, that, that large uh, media conglomerate that we ran on the side for a while. We're <laughs> going to Jackson. Uh, yeah, I've, uh, uh, just before that, I was actually working at uh, Google for the first time, um, uh, where I got to work on fun things like Google Gears uh, yeah, before we had the Chrome itself, um, which was uh, a lot of fun too. And then a bunch of the the migration to HTML5 and all of the fun stuff that uh, Hixie was very involved in uh, in wrangling back then. Um, but yeah, right now I work with Ben and and the other Ben, Ben Goodger, on on the web ecosystem side. Um, so anything to do with uh, developers, developer tooling, and the like, um, and also kind of ecosystem pieces like um, you know helping WordPress and CMSs or helping. Uh, e-commerce platforms or frameworks and really helping us kind of reach uh, developers where they are. Cool. Um, so I said we had this uh, common history of being involved with the web, but I think actually we have something else in our background. If I'm not wrong, I, I think all of us were kind of like into Java. Is that, am I wrong about that? <laughs> No, no, we were big in the Java ecosystem back in the day. Um, I think Dion, you were more on the database side, right? And I was, uh, I was on the servlet side, and uh, also Java Swing. Their rich client technology was something that I spent a lot of time on. Yeah, I got into, uh, I got into Java after uh, many years of Perl, of all things, <laughs> um, in the original dot com fun. Um, building things like vitamins.com and uh, all of these fun websites way back. Um, and in Java land, I got uh, particularly deep for a while in enterprise Java beans. Yes. HAB. Yes. Good. We're going to talk about those. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, like, I think that's important because I feel like there's a, like a, a way that this connects in, in, in a way. Um, so let's kind of set the stage a little bit for anybody who's maybe uh, may, maybe even just needs a refresher because it's been a long time, but lots of people weren't around. So, um, you know, in the mid nineties, basically um, you, the web before um, was, it didn't have JavaScript, it didn't have CSS, it wasn't scriptable, it had only very basic forms. And, um, you know, you could kind of do applications. And so we started creating like application servers was an idea that how, how that would work. And, um, but the web was kind of gross <laughs> for apps. Like it, it was not a great experience. Um, everything was completely round trip, whole page refresh. And 
there were no controls. Like I said, you couldn't script it. It wasn't very pretty. Very, very early apps weren't especially fun. But um, still, there was something appealing about it. And there was this idea that um, it should be scriptable. And so like Microsoft and Netscape both had their own ideas about what that should look like. And then there was this idea of an app server and ways to generate pages. And Microsoft and Netscape had their own ideas about that. But so did Java, uh, Sun. And then there was also this common idea that maybe it should be the same on both sides, the same language that you would use, or at least highly related. And um, yeah, so the, the web was like not, it wasn't scriptable. There was no Ajax. There was no JSON. <laughs> Um, well, I guess there was kind of JSON um, because Doug Crockford just sort of wrote it down. It always sort of existed. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, everything was uh, new and incompatible. And that's when we start getting to this era that we're going to talk about, which is where things begin to get standardized. And also... Java kind of really enters the picture and they do it with this hot Java browser. And it wasn't like major regular newspapers, not like trade organizations. It was big news. Um, can maybe somebody tell me about um, the hot Java browser? <laughs> like what the reception of that or like what was this oh, architecture? Yeah. yeah. No, it, it, like everything you're talking about, like I, remember like it was yesterday because it, it it feels like you're totally right like there was this era initially this sort of great enthusiasm of what the web made possible which was a graphical canvas that was internet connected and it was just such a new thing i was i first did web development when i was 17 working for acer um doing uh, internal facing apps and i was porting some of our windows things to the web and had to roll a bunch of infrastructure in Perl, kind of what dion alerted to and it was cool, but you quickly ran into limitations because it wasn't really a rich platform. And we'd had GUI toolkits for decades at that point. A lot of us had expectations for what you could do in a user interface. And uh, there was this sort of pent up demand that was created. And that led to things like Flash being used for applications. It led to, um, we're going to talk about Hot Java in just a moment, but like things like Hot Java um, uh, and, and evolutions of Java. And I think Microsoft had their own Silverlight thing for a while too. Like there, everyone wanted to get a real application platform, either over the top of the browser or some other internet distributed version of it. And uh, I, I, Dion, tell me if this was your experience, but I think every week I'd have a meeting with some stakeholder where they just wanted us to do something with the web. And you just have to tell people the web can't do that. Like uh, like a rich text editor or something like that. Like, no, sorry, you can't do that in the browser. And so into this sort of frustration, I'm getting the timing a little off because if I recall, Hotjob actually came out probably three or four years before the scenario I'm describing when it really came out. And the moment you're talking about, Brian, when like Entertainment Tonight and people like that would cover it, it was really crazy. But because the web was the thing, when Hot Java first came out uh, and you had like this animation, the twisting heads moving around, do you remember that? That was like the thing. Um, because we had no facility for animation at all in the browser. Everybody was like, wow, this is the future. Never really took off from there. You know, Java was just, it was, it was the Yahoo chat UI, the most mainstream version of an applet probably ever. It like, it never, it never really reached its potential for animations. I don't even think it, I don't even think anyone implemented double buffering as far as I can tell for that period of time when it looked like it might be popular and there was incompatibility issues and stuff like that. And, but uh, there was just this, Brian, there's just this really pent up demand for the web to be able to do real user interfaces along this era. Definitely. Now, now I'm thinking of like the, all of these names are coming back, like Marimba, you know? <laughs> just, like, the plug-in era, that's right. The plug-in era, exactly. Just this like plethora of like of, uh, evolution in a different way um, yeah. for people to, to explore. And yeah, I remember writing a bunch of applets and you know, lots of we we laugh at some of the you know slow loading screens that we see with single page apps today. Like, go back to the applets. You know? <laughs> just like, wait a second, booting up the VM. We get in the yeah on a dial up too. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, like on a maybe Pentium seventy five computer if you were lucky. <laughs> um, yeah, it's very difficult. Um, but what I, what I think is interesting about this is the thing that you were hitting on, Ben, which is um, like this idea of hot Java 
being really popular and that everybody was clamoring for it. Like it wasn't even really new, like this idea of like a VM, which the browser itself could even be an application hosted by the VM and inside the documents, you could have more applications and stuff. Um, Payway actually demonstrated this exact same thing with the Viola browser, which was like one of the very first browsers. And then Flash would repeat it. And I think it was like right there on the edge. It was like the adjacent possible that everybody thought would be the thing. Um, yeah. And and so we started the W3C uh, and like very quickly we got like HTML3, HTML4. Um, we got CSS um, and we got the DOM. All those things were great. And we also got XML. And I remember XML at the time, um, like it seemed almost as popular <laughs> as Java. Like it was, it was the thing, right? Like it was going to definitely, it was going to do everything. It was going to make the world so great. It did do everything for a period. And what's interesting is that at this time they said, you know, HTML is done because like that web, it, it just wasn't very good and we can do better. We can have like this rich internet application web and we can have data documents that are with XML and we can do transforms to XML and we can query XML. And it seemed like there was just like no end of the XML things that we could or would be able to do. Um, so I, I don't know about you, but like I was on board that train. Like, uh, yeah, don't you feel like there was this, this time like people undervalued the fact that a lot of people could easily onboard on the web and just start mm -hmm. building some websites um, and kind of grow from there. And it was kind of like, okay, wait, the real engineers are coming now. Yeah. We've got all of the solutions. <laughs> We're gonna like have the schema for the entire world all worked out and then we'll be done. We'll, we'll have everything. And, uh, and it was just a very kind of, pure view of of what better uh, was and it and missed all of the other side effects. In my talks and on my blog, I talk about how like at this time, like, um, you know, when I heard like Tim Berners-Lee was gonna head up this effort, you know, the guy who created the web and standards, I didn't know anything about standards. I was, I think like Ben said he was 17. I think I was 20 or something like that, um, standards just they sounded really important, you know, and I I just imagined based on what I read that they were, you know, sure, that makes a lot of sense. Like you just get the sort of Manhattan project, all the greatest minds in a room and they solve the problem and then and then we'll be done and they just tell us how to do it. And it will be it will be great. All the problems will be solved. I sort of imagine that's how it would work. And I I kind of think that maybe they imagined that too, really. <laughs> It's funny how both of these ecosystems we're talking about, the web ecosystem and uh, Java, both had these moments. Because you know the, the the golden era of Java, which I still miss, was the one where we all just listened to Sun. Sun had a plan, and uh, they'd tell us how to build applications. And we'd go to Java 1 every year and, and, and listen to the prophets on the mountain. And uh, you mentioned EJB, Dion. For me, I think that was the thing that ended that era, uh, where we all sort of said, like, I guess the emperor doesn't have any clothes. Yes. And the web, the web to a degree went through that with XML, where I, I like right there with you, Brian, I think we all were just struggling to keep up. Everything was unfolding so quickly and the architects of the internet, the architects of the web, cause it, you know, I was young, I didn't know the difference between all these people were saying this is the future, then it's clearly the future. And uh, and then when it blew up spectacularly, then it, it also sort of created the same sort of dynamic where instead of the web being driven by this central force, you remember like specs too, we'd all like consume the latest spec and that was it. And like, we'd get yeah. mad at the browsers that they didn't implement the spec and it was all about the spec. And then kind of, I know chronologically, there's probably several years here, but kind of in my mind around the same time, HTML shifted to the living spec, the XML stuff that we'd all been told was the future kind of, kind of, I mean, I don't even, there wasn't an official moment, it just decayed. And, uh, and then that's when Ajax came into the four, which is really kind of flipping it on its head when we all said it's not about the spec, it's about what the browsers can do. And one of the things that changed here too is instead of looking at the spec that the browser asserted to support, you'd do tests to see what the browser could actually support. And it just sort of changed the whole 
the whole nature of the beast. Yeah, it's funny how just pragmatism keeps kicking in, right? Like I mean, with EJB, there was there were two notions of data related objects, right? Be managed persistence and container managed. And you're like, oh, there could be because all these different use cases. In reality, Oracle wanted one, IBM wanted the other. And so instead we make the standard have both, right? And then <laughs> I'm part of, I was on the JDO uh, working group in the JCP and it was just like, why are we even doing, you know, um, relational databases anymore? We're, we're all about object orientation. Like that should be the way. And there's just like, theoretically, this will be the future. And then Hibernate comes along and they're like, no, 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 the database is actually pretty good. How about we just give you a way to nicely access them? And that's actually what everyone wanted. Because guess what? There's a whole slew of people that run reports and all kinds of stuff where they yeah. need SQL, right? So it's just funny how like the pragmatism kind of comes in and often ends up being the, the thing that wins the day. I remember that moment when I was in the thick of grappling with all of this persistence layer complexity in Java and .NET, you know, when they did .NET 2 and made their play, like their model was result sets. It was just yeah. so, I wanted to cry. It was awesome <laughs> to get back to the simplicity of the relational model. Yeah, so actually, uh, we're kind of into this thing already. But um, I wanted to say, like, in around 1998 or 1999, I think, is when W3C said the web is done. Like, not, not the web, but HTML is, is done. And we're going to go do this XML app thing. Um, but, you know, like, if you weren't there, you missed this gap of, like, about a decade where uh, it was about a decade from then when we finally got like a real HTML5 specification. Um, so all this stuff happened in sort of uh, from 1998 to 2004. All this great stuff was happening, even though nothing was happening in standards. And then from 2004 to say 2008, it just kept going. And 2004 is interesting because uh, what was happening in developer land is uh, people were sharing things. Like I know Ajaxian wasn't uh, created in, in 2004 yet, right? I think it was uh, 2005, but uh, yeah, lots, but lots of uh, like lots of things like Ajaxian were springing up. Like people were blogging and sharing and um, doing sort of the opposite of big design, right? Like they were, like publishing a thing and people were like, oh, that sounds good. And they would try it and they would say, that could be better. Let's like iterate and trade ideas. And uh, I don't know, do, like, does anybody, like I, I sort of feel like this is uh, a really interesting thing that we have all these sort of best, brightest minds in a room with all the companies behind them. And they were like, this, this web isn't, it's not good at apps. Like it's really gross. Like we, we don't want to do that. But developers kept using the tools that we have, and um, I feel like there was this like golden age for in that decade, yeah. even though standards did nothing. Right. Well, even like you know, talking about AJAX and uh, and uh, XML HTTP requests, right? Just it's just so interesting. Where did that come from? It comes from Microsoft. Uh, oh, is it just from the browser team? No, no, no. It's from Exchange. And right, wanting to be able to do things, and so someone builds an ActiveX control, and you know, fast forward, um, like that's where the evolution comes in, right? From this again, more of the the plugin type model that we can then take in and bring elsewhere. Now, if you start with the web, you've got this, you know, this object that's native to the web that I can just use on Navigator. Um, that didn't. That's not how it was created. You were used to, you know, all of the early times, like testing for the different names of the ActiveX control to make sure you get the right one. It came from that view of just like, what can this thing even do? No, I, I think that's that's totally. It was it was the closest thing to like a knowledge gold rush that I think I've ever seen in my career because like we we'd all studied the specs. We knew what the sort of web gods had told us was possible on the platform. And then to discover that there was this thing just sitting in the browser that, like Dion, like you said, had been there. And I think by the time Ajax really hit, uh, Mozilla had already implemented it so that they could deal with compatibility issues um, that had cropped up because people had, had written web apps that only worked with, with IE. 
And so to have that just sitting there, it, it caused everyone to sort of feel like, well, what else is possible? Because this, this is a huge thing to have missed. Uh, what else have we missed? And uh, it was just so exciting. And then we had this unholy bridge over to Flash, and people would try to figure out what you could build using both together. And uh, I mean, as you all know, like every every day, it seemed like we were discovering something new, and the whole community was just watching, kind of in awe. Whether you were a designer and you were like realizing that the shackles that that had bound you for so long were now breaking off, or you were a developer, or you were a business stakeholder, everyone was just sort of watching in awe at the fact that the platform could do all these things that we, that we never really realized. And I think the Google Maps DOM hack, if you even want to call it a hack, landed at almost the same time, which didn't use originally a, a XHR, at least for its core UI. And that was also another of these moments that just caused us to go like, wow, we, we, we didn't know the platform could do all this. Yeah. yeah I remember that time of like, the push to kind of rebrand Ajax from, it's not like literally using this, just about using this technology. Obviously most of it wasn't even XML <laughs> from the get go. It was just about delivering these higher quality experiences, right? And a lot of things that people would say are like birth of you know great Ajax stuff and things like Google Maps that didn't even use some of this stuff at the beginning, right? And there's just so many of those. And just seeing, you know, just over the weekend, right? Seeing people like Scott Schiller, you know, created sound manager to do be a you know bridge over to that world. Remember like Cipher, yeah, to be able to get like the fonts over from Flash. Yeah. To be able, right? It was just everyone's just like grasping out. They wanted to do these things, and at least they had a view, a, a way to either find things in the browser or through these through plugins and like they had a way of kind of wrapping it all together and making it available that. We can then come along as browsers and platform folks, and and uh, you know underground that and 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 bake it in. Yeah, even these really really basic ideas today, like we didn't have like query selector, um, and you know like originally I think you could get an element by ID, and I, I think there were like the live collections from DOM zero. There were like DOM collections where you could refer to basically like the tag names and IDs. Um, yeah. But uh, I think it was maybe Dean Edwards that did the first thing I saw that was like, you could get them by the class too. I thought, oh, it was a really interesting. And then somebody else said, oh, but what if you could do this other thing? And like eventually through lots of libraries and ideas, you know, we very rapidly got from nothing and this like really incompatible, painful to use, like, you know, which, like, do you access the XML HTTP request object or is it an active X thing that you have to go through? Which event model do you use? Because they're not compatible either. <laughs> like, I mean, it was like, do you remember how, like how painfully uneven the web was? Um, uh, we got very quickly from that to jQuery and you didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. And it was like the, you know, the API for it was just like really nice and convenient. It had like a plugin model, which was like made it really easy for you to like add your own ideas to. And I think like that thing that you were talking about, about people just being passionate about it and like, just having fun and they're not being huge egos where, um, you know, people can sort of take your idea and do better. And then everybody gains from that. Yeah. It was funny how, like, like I always pictured the dojo folks, uh, some of which we still work closely with uh, today. Um, it must just have been sitting back so often because they could just be like, we, yeah, we did that one already in dojo.foo, you know, like they had a module for everything, but just the ergonomics, right? It was just like literally just like instead of dojo.byid, it'd be able to do the dollar sign um, and double dollar sign and prototype and all of those kind of things. And just like, what's the minimal kind of surface area that will give me the biggest bang for the buck. And there's the you know browser compatibility side that you kind of needed a shim just to deal with that, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. And then there's just like the styles that people are like, right? Like the prototype folks, very tied to kind of Ruby type way of thinking mm -hmm. that that melded really nicely. jQuery functional, you know, way of thinking. It was kind of really fun for people to just explore, you know, different 
you know, ways of thinking and fashion to, to build on top of things too. It's also fun to remember that back in that era, like we didn't actually know how JavaScript worked as a community. Like it was really, it, you'd hardly ever use it. You'd use it when you had to. And part of Ajax was also just figuring out the language and how to create things that weren't globals everywhere and, and, uh, and that whole journey. But uh, there's just so much, Brian, that we all had to figure out together. And, uh, and it took a while for it to start evolving, but then it feels like three or four years into it, maybe a little longer, things started to evolve really quickly. And I don't think it's ever changed since then. Things continue to evolve really, really fast since then. There was a W3C uh, workshop on this problem of web apps because we still had not realized the replacement. Things were getting very complicated. It, and yet the web kept flourishing. Like the web was doing more and more better and better. And people were building like very rich apps increasingly with the web we have. And, um, you know, that this thing was, what should we do about that? Um, should we maybe admit that you can make at least medium sized apps? Maybe not, maybe not real apps, whatever you want to call it. Maybe, maybe you still do that, but for the, for the web we have, shouldn't we make like an HTML5 and like the W3C said no. And that's how we wind up with the, what, working group or what wig? I mean, it is interesting to look back and see how uh, it would be very rational to say, you know, we've got different protocol building blocks, HTTP, the, you know, all of these different pieces. So why does HTML can just be one of them over here? It doesn't need to be so tied. It doesn't have to be like the one GUI toolkit to roll them all. So we should have, why don't we have others? Uh, that could come in and that could render very differently on top of you know a lot of the same stack. Like you could totally see someone making that case and thinking that that's going to be the natural future. And then you had a lot of the people back then talking about just data, 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 exchange, you know, machines on the web and you know that whole side of things. And so we should that's why XML makes makes a lot of sense. Like we should it should have more rigor for it for all of the machine stuff that we're going to do. And, and then there's the whole view of separating all of the concerns. Um, and so we are going to you know, have very different user agent things going on. And so we want to keep it very, you know, this whole semantic web world, like all of that stuff going on. Um, and it's kind of interesting to think through like, Why really didn't, didn't that take off? Like, why, why was it this, you know, evolution on top of, you know, the crappy platform that, um, that ended up winning out. It is fascinating, the inertia that, that happens or the momentum, however you think about it. But I, I think I would have predicted SVG to have done better than it did. Like we have awesome SVG implementations in the browsers. SVG, if you think about it logically, seems like a much better uh, platform for creating interfaces, especially with the diversity of screen sizes and everything that are, that are on the, the market but we don't really touch it. And it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because if you talk to some of the team, like why shouldn't developers use SVG? People will say like, well, it's just not as tested. It's just not as compatible. It's kind of buggy because people don't use it. So, so there's just not, you know, it doesn't have that breakaway, but it is interesting to like a parallel universe where browser plugins were forced to create declarative artifacts that were rendered as though they were a different type of protocol. Would that have changed anything? It's fascinating to think about. The conversation we're having about specs, just one thing that I've always sort of wondered is the role that the decision to make HTML5 be an endless spec, um, you know, a versionless spec played. Because up until that moment, it felt like we were getting such momentum with the no notion of HTML5, of people reconverging on a spec, and of the industry feeling like this is it. And then, and then it almost seemed like that all that energy dissipated in a moment when, when I guess we, Dion, Google uh, at the time, uh, decided not to do that. Is that I look at that and I feel like there were good reasons to do it, but it feels like it was a shift change where all of a sudden now people didn't have a version to talk about. Uh, there wasn't like a moment when some new version would come out up before then people would, people talked about HTML5, Brian, like when is that going to come out? Cause we have four, when's yeah. five going to come out and, and what's six going to be? Oh my gosh, what is it going to enable? And all that just kind of vanished. And I, and I wonder if we sort of missed that or missed something like that as a community. Yeah, and just stabilizing in general, right? It's like these all of our browsers are shipping every four, six weeks. Um, it's just like a constant uh, dynamic system that's out there. 
that in in many ways is so great now that developers can like you know pin to evergreen browsers so to speak. Um, but on the flip side, you don't the, you know you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow when a new browser a new OS gets updated that um, affects your application. Um, and so you do feel like you're like constantly kind of swimming, uh, uh, you know, in the stream at the same time. So yeah, would it be nice to have more anchor points? Um, like, you know, HTML6, should we bring it back? Uh, maybe we can add a few more tags this time for modern application <laughs> capability. The logo's open source, we can just add the vector points. <laughs> yeah, <it's fine. laughs>